that's working down in the Bitterroot. Um, they supported a bunch of volunteers to go in to take attractants out of campsite to look for where there was attractants in the Bitterroots and in the wilderness, um, educate visitors that they saw while they were hiking on the trails about bear safety. Um, they provided, they did a lot of local education and outreach down in the Bitterroot um, and provided bear sprays. I don't know if they were provide the bear sprays, but the biggest thing that they for them was the removing bear attractions from campsites and packed out trash and back into campsites. And we have, I will say that another thing that David and I have been kind of talking about is we're, we are going to compile these, all these reports into a report to send out to the um, committee, but it just didn't, didn't happen before this meeting. So hopefully we can get that next time. Um, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, one of the areas, of course, with 399, we did have. Last year, we did have a bunch from the Yellowstone or the Jackson Hole area, but the one that we really felt like was kind of, we hadn't worked with the, this district before, and we really liked how they wanted to do more on installing grizzly bear wear signs. Um, they were really focusing on the Southern district of their forest, um, where they didn't have a lot of signage about bears, and then talking about um, maintain, like talk, telling people about the food storage order. So just being, bringing that awareness to people that were recreating in the forest, that there was a food storage order and that they were in bear country. So you can see some of the signs that they did. So they installed 34 grizzly bear wear signs, 10 food storage signs, um, and they were focusing on that southern district area or southern part of their district. And then we had a combo one. So the Greater Yellowstone and the NCDE. So the Montana Discovery Foundation partnered with the Helena Lewis and Clark Forest Service and they this is the fifth year they've been running this program and igbc has funded given some type of funding whether it be full or partial funding um, all five years and so the main um, goal of this project is to coordinate or they did a lot of coordinating with forest employees whether they were in person or virtual trainings for bear sprays and actually on that forest they keep track of who has done a bear spray training and you have to do bear spray training every two years which I thought we, you know, we really liked that idea that they were maintaining that constant education. Um, and then you can see all the different communities that they were delivering um, education programs to. And then they did set up the bear trailer at the Red Ants Pants Music Festival and then the uh, 50th anniversary celebration of the Scapegoat Wilderness. So this is one of those projects that's working in between the two recovery zones and a, and a major like connectivity pool. Or I mean, when you say they, who's they? Is it they. It's um, the Forest Service, but the position, they ran the position through the Montana Discovery Foundation. So the Forest Service partnered with them to help fund a bear ranger. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, interrupt me whenever. Um, the Northern Continental Divide, Swan Valley Connections. This is a group that has done a lot. They are inside the recovery zone. Um, the Swan Valley is in between the missions. Um, and the Bob Marshall Wilderness, it's the valley in between. And this group, Swan Valley Connections, has done a lot. And their biggest thing is providing private property um, with consultations. And only that only residents that want to, they're not trying to push um, on, you know, on everybody. But if people are coming in, if they're new to the area, or if they're having conflicts and issues, um, they will go onto the property and kind of help with consultation. And they do help they do partner with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and our bear specialist. So if in their um, in their report they talked about if the bear specialists are very busy, they'll help go put up a temporary electric fence for them and stuff like that. So they really do have a great um, cooperative partnership with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. They also have a bear resistant garbage container loaner program. So part of our funding helps to purchase some of those containers. So they purchased 30 this year because they're constantly needing to re replace, fix, um, give out to new residents, things like that. And I think to date, I mean, they're in the couple hundreds that they've given out to the community in that Swan Valley area. They have an electric fence program. They do this in cooperation with Defenders of Wildlife and with um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they listed, and Montana Fish, Life and Parks. And so in this last year, they constructed eight permanent fences and then assisted, like I said, FWP at conflict sites, putting up some temporary fences when FWP just didn't have time because they had other places to, to be. Um, they host a lot of events. Um, this group, 
uh, was one of the first groups to start the concept of a bear fair. And so they, and this was back in 2010, 2009, they started this concept of a bear fair. And so they um, have hosted a lot of these bear fairs and, and attended um, six different educational events. But then a lot of people were, they had a lot of people coming to them saying, how do you do these bear fairs? You know, what do you do? And so they actually, um, they couldn't, their bear ranger had some family issues. So she wasn't using all the funding that we were giving her. So they asked, hey, can we make this how, using IGBC funds, can we make this how-to guide? Um, so when communities come to us, or it's just on the website, um, you can look, it's on their uh, homepage and then you can go to it. But a how-to guide of how we organize these community events and what a bear fair is, which we felt was really good for um, education. And then they do produce um, a quarterly newsletter called The Confluence, and it's just, it's a really great publication. It's really well done, and it's just another way for them to get information out to their community. Um, between the NCDE and the Selkirk County Act, the Kootenai National Forest, and specifically the Kasanka District, has asked us for money pretty consistently every year, so we did fund them again last year. Um, and they have the same goals. It is funding a bear ranger. Um, or in this year, this particular year, we supplied a lot of um, education information, supplies, and materials. And so um, their main goals are to educate, educating forest users about the Kootenai Forest. Food storage order was a big one that they were trying to focus on. And then engaging with the public to inform them about being safe and being bear aware. And so they did this signs community events, high school trips. Um, they set up a summer bear booth at the Lincoln. They really wanted to focus in on the Lincoln County Fair because they felt like that was bringing together more of their, um, instead of users, recreation users, they were they were focusing more on community members. Um, and then while they're out walking around, making public contacts and talking about being bear aware on the forest. And then they have nine food poles scattered throughout the district. And so they go and check and maintain all of those food bowls. So that's one thing that our money helped fund there. And then in the Cabinet Yak ecosystem, um, the Friends of the Scotchman Peak Wilderness, this was a new nonprofit group for us. They are more in the southern end, just north of, I put a map, <laughs> just north of 200 there. Um, so it was kind of a new area. It's just outside the recovery area. Um, and so they hosted Kim Annis to come and train them and some of their, um, I, think, I, I don't, can't remember how they call them, but some of their higher up or some of their more uh, year round people to be trainers to then train other people how to use bear sprays. And that was a big part of it. And so in, their, in the money we gave them, they purchased 72 inner bear spray cans for training and then 24 to be used by their group so that, and they were the people leading hikes doing trail projects, and then just out on the trail being ambassadors for that area. And then the Kootenai um, Forest in the Cabinet Yak in the Libby District, they installed, um, this is grizzly bear habitat signs. I actually didn't get a picture of the signs, so I don't have anything. Um, and then they, part of theirs was supporting a local YCC program to help install the sign doors. And then in the North Cascades, we gave money to Defenders of Wildlife. They provide bear awareness and bear spray trainings to community members around the Cascades. And then they, they using our money, they purchased 90 cans for bear sprays, or regular bear sprays and 12 inner cans for those trainings. And that's where a lot of our money went to. And then also to um, Zoe Hanley. Yeah, Hanley. Um, and she put on a lot of events and does a lot of traveling and around the Cascades for Defenders um, time bear aware and with communities. And then in the Selkirk ecosystem in the Panhandle, um, so this was a forest service, the Panhandle district, they um, did a food store, they had a food storage infrastructure rental program. Um, again, I didn't get a report on how many they bought, but so we helped support that project last year. And then Idaho Fish and Game, they purchased 100, 190 bear sprays to hand out to landowners, hunters, um, and then there was 15 events that they attended. And so they probably contacted around 4,000 public up in that panhandle area. And those the pictures are from the Idaho fishing game. 
And then we do try to, we have a couple that focus on all ecosystems. Um, and some people ask me, do you, if we do more ecosystems than just one ecosystem, is it, is it, you know, better to fund? And it just really depends on the proposal, like what you're trying to do. So um, Defenders of Wildlife, we do give Defenders of Wildlife funds we have for a very long time. Um, they cover the entire grizzly bear range. Um, they've completed over 500 fences. They hit 500 fences, I think, last year. I don't see Aaron anymore, but I think last year they hit 500 fences, and so it just keeps growing from there. So last year they completed 37 fences, and then they did an additional 64 with partners, um, and then they attend a lot of bear fairs and different, pro different um, events, community events, to talk about electric fencing and the use of there around all the ecosystems. Montana Fish, Alive, and Parks. Um, it says all ecosystems, but it's, it's more specific to Montana, but we have a lot of ecosystems in Montana. So um, they, a while back, I don't remember when the first edition was, but a while back they put together a resource guide for educators in Montana. And um, they, at, they were going to redo it. Um, it was out of date, so it took, kind of took a little bit longer. We did fund this one. Um, the year before, but they didn't use the funding. Funding was for printing. They didn't use it that year, so they asked if they could just move it a year up, and we said no problem. So this year they did end up finalizing the guide and getting it printed. They printed 300 copies, um, and they're distributing it to different educators. If they, if the educator completes a workshop that they put on, um, they give them one of the guides for free, but there are digital copies available for free. Um, on the Fish, Life, and Parks website, and then also they partnered with the Boone and Crockett Club on this one for also additional funds for printing. So, and then people and carnivores, um, we funded them last year, and I was super impressed when I got their final report. Um, and I'm not just saying because Kim's in the in the room, but she never fails to um, impress me with all of the. And I didn't put any words up because I, there was just so much media. Um, you can see they have a residential bear, like HOAs and residential vacation rentals. I mean, just the amount of social media and brochures that they put together and how well done they were. It was really impressive. And so People in Carnivores kind of works in that, that in-between area again by Yellowstone um, NCD in the Bitterroot is where Kim is specifically. Right, Kim? Okay. <laughs> And so, yeah, just a ton of education, a ton of outreach, working with communities in her area. So um, just really impressive. And and, um, and then the short video that we showed at the beginning of the, of the Bear community session. So this year, we actually completed our cycle of selecting grants before this meeting. Last year was after this meeting. So I can tell you that these are the selections that we've made this year. We got a, we had $120,000 in ask. And so um, here is the list again. Again, Defenders of Wildlife and People Are in Carnivores um, came out on top for our multi-ecosystem um, category. Uh, Bear Creek Council, we funded them two years ago. Um, they didn't put in last year, but then we were funding them again. Um, they're doing a ton of, we felt um, like with the recent kind of the recent bears that they had in Gardner, <laughs> that the community is trying to put out bear resistant cans and things like that. And we really agreed with that. And because they're right there by the recovery zone, we wanted to help support them as much as possible. So Bear Creek, that money's going. The American Bear Foundation is trying to do this bear spray giveaway. Um, and it's in Idaho. It's, in, it's out of West Yellowstone, I think is the main area and so they're buying a ton of bear sprays and giving them out to whoever kind of wants them and is recreating in that area. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and Jamie Jonkel has been working with Missoula Bear Smart and that's what that money is going to. It's going to help their information education and outreach for the Bear Smart program in Missoula. Um, Trina and the Rocky Mountain Ranch, Rocky Mountain Front Ranch Lands Group um, she is going to put on some advanced um, events, educating people about the use of, of dogs and, and livestock. Um, Don Valley Connections again, although that's not the full fund that they asked for, we did give them partial funding. <laughs> Idaho Fish and Game, Bob Barb would like one of the charging bears to help people, um, to help uh, people with bear sprays. <laughs> that's not the full amount that she asked for, but we were able to give her partial funding. And then the Colville National Forest in the 
um, Selkirk is looking to put some signs up on some areas where they're closing roads and give more and fair awareness to that area. And then Western um, Wildlife Outreach and Jane and the Cascades is doing a bunch of work around the Cascades, educating and doing a, a lot of education and, and events specifically for bears. And so as David told you in his opening, we are funding, we are, it just worked out this way. We're just funding a lot more NGOs than we are any federal or state partners. That used to not look like that. We used to give most of the money to the Forest Service. They, I think the change is, the Forest Service used to always ask for us to help with bear rangers. So it was like staff time that they were asking for. And then there was a switch in how the Forest Service, the timing of, there was this HR, it's HR stuff. So, and so we couldn't, we couldn't give money to bear rangers anymore because it was, the timing was off. And so a lot of them switched gears to asking for more signs and brochures. And then some of them, we just haven't gotten a lot of Forest Service asked lately. Um, but we have gotten a lot more NGO asks and they're coming up with a lot of good projects and their partners that we haven't partnered with before. So that does anyone have any questions about grants or not really grants, but the funding proposals or anything like that? No, just a, oh, I just have a question. I just had a comment on how impressive it is on all the work that these entities are able to accomplish with that tiny, tiny, tiny bit of money. Mm -hmm. Like they are great, you know, the sliver and they're really able to leverage that and make a big impact. Yeah, it's super impressive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of calls like, oh, you know, we need this much. And I'm, you know, I, you know, I'll use Trina as an example, which she's not here anymore. But, you know, she, she asked me, she said, I, I need $10,000. And I said, Trina, we have 42 that we can give out. Right. We can't give you specific. I mean, I would love to, you know, if that was the case, it'd be great to give you just 10,000. But we have to look across the whole. We like to spread it out across the entire range. We don't just want to give it to one area. Um, and so she 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 got that and she then only asked for three thousand dollars or whatever it was and then tried to use it for match and so that's what we're kind of hoping is like our little gift will help match with something yeah. we're in 22 you showed which ecosystems which projects went to but in 23 you just you know you just released them but did you also succeed in getting projects funded in each ecosystem yep yeah that's, that's sometimes hard yeah so the defenders and people were all ecosystems um, the Bear Creek and the American Bear Foundation are uh, GYE. The um, Jamie, Trina, and Luke are all NCDE. And then these uh, Selkirk Cabinet Yaks are these two and Cascades. So, yeah, we did. We tried. Um, and you didn't hear me say Bitterroot. We didn't get a single one from the Bitterroot. But we kind of used Kim's People and Carnivores because she works in that in-between area. Um, we were like, oh, that's helping the Bitterroot out in some shape or form but we were, we didn't get any better route um we have in the past though right oh yeah oh yeah it, i yeah and i don't know why i mean maybe it wasn't put out to the group people forgot you know last year the bitter route one was the great burn alliance out of missoula they didn't ask for money again this year which was too bad because it in their report they did a really good job no so. or i think they did a great job <laughs> um so one of the things that, so back in a little bit of, because people are new, back in 2020, January of 2020, right before the pandemic shut everything down, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks did pull off an information education and outreach summit. It was in Helena, Montana. It was focused on Montana, but we got people from Washington, Idaho. I don't know if anyone from Wyoming came. I think, I don't know. There was, we had, we had great coverage. Um, uh, and it, it was way beyond just Montana. And what they focused on there was getting people that are doing information and education work together to talk about what you're doing, what I can do, how can we partner and help each other. And so the first afternoon or the first evening, people had out, you know, sandwich boards about like what they did and brochures. And we just kind of went around the room and you mingled and you talked to people and you about what everyone was doing. And then the second day, there was a great recreation panel because at that time, high speed rec, especially like mountain biking and just recreation in general was kind of the topic that they chose. So they had a really good recreation panel and it was, we had a Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks warden there. We had someone from the Whitefish Trails, which is a private 
or a nonprofit trails system in um, town of Whitefish. There was an outfitter that outfits in the Rocky Mountain or in the Bob Marshall. Um, and remember everyone now. <laughs> anyway, they had a great panel and we discussed um, recreation for a couple hours in the morning. And then it switched out and they we broke out into small groups and they gave us topics, messaging and tools and um, audiences. And we talked about grizzly bears and how, you know, what are the big topics of each one of those? And they came out with a compendium. I have a copy of the compendium. We can um, give it to the group, but it came it had a lot of actions and needs, and it was really interesting to go back and read through it and how many things we are doing. It might not be IGPC, but other people are doing. And so we have kind of come, it helped us come a little bit further from that first um, summit. One of the things was that they'd like to continue to do the summit. They felt like IGPC would be the great, a great play or a great fit for the for us to host the summit. Um, and so we do have some funds, um, some IGBC funds to do it. We were trying to do it in 2023. It kind of got away from us and we just weren't able to pull it off. We couldn't get good dates. Um, but so we would like to do it in 2024 and we'd like to do it in Coeur d'Alene. And so at the Coeur d'Alene Resort. Um, and so um, I don't know if anyone else has any questions about that. Um, we have, I'm not doing it alone. Our subcommittee is also interested, you know, we're interested in helping out. Um, our topics, some of the topics that have been discussed are, um, we attended a human, or I attended a human bear conflict workshop and um, I can't remember her name right now. She's from Parks Canada. She gave a great um, talk about looking at your audience and surveying your audience and how do you portray per, um, the right message to your audience based on knowing your audience. And so we're going to, Mona? Ramona. Ramona, that's her name. Ramona from Parks Canada. And she's been, she's actually said she will come in. She's worked with social scientists from Canada and come up with a really great way to um, talk about educate, education, giving out information, education and outreach programs and, um, and just tailoring them to your audience. And so we talked about that. We've talked about, um, getting some bear resistant container pro, uh, people there to talk about that. And then a great place if we're talking about bear smart communities, we could also do that. But like I said, it's not, we haven't really started the planning of that, um, but I have a lot of nonprofits that are also interested in being on the committee to help. Plan. What time of year? January, okay. February. The early, that, that was early. early. The last one was, was end of January. Um, we kind of did that end of January, beginning of February time would be perfect. Yeah. Oh, so like you guys, we also have a five year plan that we work on. Um, we did have a subcommittee meeting, um, but we were talking about other things and we decided to wait until you guys talk about your five year plan. Is that really? <laughs> well, um, it really helps us all then. See where we should go with our five year plan and how we because we're supporting you in what you guys are making priorities and how and what you're kind of listing. So, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm trying to be honest. It really helps us in the IEO world then say, OK, how can we support what the executive committee is trying to do? Because we're already supporting the subcommittees. We're going to the meetings. We're sitting at the tables. We're reporting on what we're doing in this room. Um, and then they're getting reports from all of the agencies and bringing them to our subcommittee. But we really need, we want to support what the executive committee is doing and how can we do that in information education outreach. So our last year goals, I just threw in a couple of accomplishments. You know, one of our goals is to ensure effective communication, communication across all levels of IGBC. Like I said, we're sitting in on all the meetings, we're listening to all the groups, and then we're, we're um, reporting out at all of the sub and then we're coming together as a subcommittee and making sure we all know what's going on sometimes or as much as we can. Um, we're doing consistent messaging. Um, we are working with Western Wildlife Outreach. Um, this is going to, this will be an action item for us probably. They have a brochure that um, 
IGBC has their logo on. It's a bear brochure. It's one of the best. It's a very, it's one of the best bear brochures. Everybody uses it. Um, we are a partner with them on the brochure. Um, it's just hard. We don't have access to the actual printing copy of the brochure. So that's one of the things we're working on is trying to get that. I mean, we helped produce it. We should have access to it to, and not have to go through them and do printing in Seattle. Like it's, it's a little crazy, <laughs> but it's okay. We're working on it. Um, and then, yeah. Oh, and then every, one thing that came up in all of the different subcommittee meetings that a lot of the IEO people are working on is getting word out to these VRBOs. Um, you know, these are, they're staying in people's, they're getting off the airplane or driving in, and then they're just going to someone else's house and they're never co potentially coming into contact with any brochures. You know, hotels have brochures, um, chamber of commerce, things like that. So a lot of the subcommittee chairs have been working on, um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks did, I know Kim did, uh, working on VRBO brochures that people can put up in their houses. So Dylan Tabish, VRBOs have to be registered with the county. And so you can actually like send a mass email to everyone that's a VRBO saying, can you put this brochure up in your, your VRBO so that you can help educate people that are being grizzly bear and be bear aware. The, the VRBO company itself can't help us with that or won't help us with that? Um, I Sorry. don't know that. No, it's I, we haven't looked at that. Dylan, this was just Dylan knew that that they were in the county. And so he just kind of sent he did a it was like a first round. Like, let's see if I can just even get it out and if I had county. Um, but it's VRBO, you know, Airbnb. And then those I don't know if you're aware of the hip camp. The people can have. Yeah, <laughs> me neither. Um, no, keep, okay. yeah. <laughs> people can use their property and have it. You can you can advertise your property for people to come camp on private property and pay whatever. But there's no the it first got brought up at the NCD meeting, the CSKT. They were about to put a, a highway crossing right next to a property that allowed eight sites of a hip camp. And they all had garbage cans chained to a post that weren't very resistant. They were just aluminum with the tops. And they were like, oh my gosh, we're about to funnel a bunch of wildlife right next to a camp that's not very resistant. So that's kind of another challenge, I think, that a lot of the, and we did get people in carnivores did actually write a grant proposal to help the CSKT with that. But it's their own by Expedia. It's like a bigger, yeah, everyone's owned by Expedia. So. Well, it's a big issue. Just really quick. So in terms of ensure consistency of messages, your group has produced a set of universal messages. Yes. That are on our website. Mm -hmm. And one low hanging fruit I've heard is that we need to put that into some different formats that people can, can grab and translate. Oh, uh, because yeah. it's right now it's written in this according text. That's true. Yeah. And you have to click on the specific user yeah. to then see the messages that, that IGBC adopted. So like a single brochure or a single piece of paper is what you're saying. Yeah. And that is that's easy enough. We can do that. Um, our third goal was to increase use of bear spray by people who live, work, and recreate in um, bear range. Um, I think we still have put the three hundred dollar. I think is all it is every year. There's this stocked hunting guide um, here in the Bozeman area, um, and it really goes out to a lot of the Yellowstone um, area. But Yellowstone, they tend to have a lot of mortalities during hunting season. So we felt like that was a good fix uh, fit to educate them about, you know, please use bear spray. And they do get it out to I think it's like 3,000 people. And then there's like another 7,000 it goes out to virtually, whether they click on it or not, it's hard to say, but it does cover a pretty wide range around the Yellowstone ecosystem. And then as you saw, when I was talking about all the groups that are that are were given fundings to, a lot of people are catching on with this train the trainer or bear spray trainings for employees working and recreating. So I think we're continuing to do that and trying to increase awareness of bear spray. And then back in two, I don't even remember when I first brought this up, 2020. Yeah. Um we asked the executive committee. You know, if we talked about the Bear Spray uh, or the Bear Spray, the Bear Smart Community Program. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so uh, we continually kind of updated the executive committee about it. Well, in 2022, we have completed 
the Bear Smart Community Manual. So we do have a manual. Um, I mean, it's still, it, I would say it's still in rough draft because there, you know, there's parts of it that maybe we want to adopt and maybe there's parts of it we don't want to adopt, but the framework is there. Um, we hired a writer editor to do it. So it was very, it was a consistent um, manual. Uh, we had, and I'll talk about who was a part of that group in a second. We put together a PowerPoint for communities to have um, so they could talk about the Bear Spray or the Bear Smart manual. And then we also put together a one page brochure. So those three things are complete right now. Are they, but they're not on the, they're not on the website yet. No, we haven't put them on the website because we were waiting for how, what this group wants to do with that program. So, so in talking with that, that's all of the five year goal or all of our five year goals that we have. So, okay. Bye. A question. So when we have these standard messages, messaging, mm -hmm. when we're finding like some of those groups we show, yep. they're reminding us for, for signage. Did we make and use the yep. standard message? We do. Okay. Yep. And most of those are forest service and they just use the standard. I will say, I wish I wish the forest service would update a couple of them because the graphics are like from the. I'm making um, a note. Are you okay? <laughs> Not like trying to get anyone to No, I mean they're great. The message is there. It's great. It, you know, it's good messaging. But we just we could update the graphics a little bit. But yeah, there we do. Um, a lot of people send us signs and say, "Hey, we're about to put out the sign. Are you okay with it?" And I, it's great. We've caught things, and it's not just me catching it. It's other people on our subcommittee. They'll catch little things here and there. And so I, it, it, a lot of people do send us pictures of signs so, to make sure that they're up with me. Same messaging. So this was the, these are all the people. Some of these, you know, some people don't work for these agencies anymore, but these are all the people that have at some point can, um, participated in that Bear Smart Community Working Group. Um, and so Andrea Morehouse, um, she is out of Alberta. Um, she is a PhD. She works with communities and she does a lot of community work in Alberta with livestock. Um, and landowners there. She was our writer editor that we um, contacted with. And then on the ITBC subcommittee, um, you can see I like Kim Annis, you know, she transferred out or Christy took over her chair spot, but she was a part of our subcommittee when we first started the Bear Smart Community Working Group. Kim Johnson, like I said, um, who brought the idea to us, she was on the group, Jeremy Nixon. And then from Wyoming, um, Dusty was there, and then Dusty left, and then Kyle came in, Dan Thompson participated. Mike Badgery with BC, he was the one that has, he ran the Bear Smart um, BC program. So we really, it was great to have him in the beginning. He actually has now moved on to a different job, um, but he really helped us like what was working in BC, what didn't work, you know, what just problems or things they had learned. Um, David sat in, and then Chris and then she worked for WCS. WCS. Thank you. I don't remember. It's been so long. Chris and then she worked for WCS. So she um, was really big in like Bear Smart Big Sky. And so we were using her knowledge of what she, how she had worked with that community um, and some of the things that she had learned. Um, but she did move on and she was working in Alaska now. Hillary also, I think, said. She was, I'm sorry, I didn't put her on the board. Um, and so that's all I got for my update. Um, I, it's not just me, it's our, my subcommittee, it's the Bear Smart Working Group. Um, I just help kind of coordinate it all, but everyone does a lot of good work and then everybody that we partner with and we give funds to do a really good job. So does anyone have any questions on that? Yeah. I have to get my paper because I was, I was going to ask one question about yes. the 42,000 for that. This year, you said that you write that it was 9,000 in requests. 120,000 in requests. We funded 40, well, 41,990. Some of these, some of these proposals are like, I need 5,225. And if I don't, so they get done. So yeah, we funded. What's the trend in overall requests to request? It has come up. 
Yep, it's consistent. Like last year, we had 156,000, and then this year we were back down to 120,000. But um, and David kind of showed that trend in his slide, so I don't want to put it back in there. But um, when back in like 20, so we we have really good data from 2015 on. So in 2015, ITBC was funding 36,000 dollars. Um, when I came in as chair, we were spending a lot of money just printing brochures. And because COVID had hit, people weren't handing out brochures. So I asked if we could take some of that money that we were printing and put it into IEO grants. And so we increased it to 42,000 from 36. Um, but then the years that we didn't have an executive coordinator, we did use some of the funding in that position to fund IEO grants. So that's why we, there were some years where we funded $70,000. Um, but now we've gone back down to the 42. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, do you want me to talk about the, oh. Do you want to do Bear Smart, David, right now? So we're actually on time on the agenda. Oh. Um, for we've got a couple other reports yep. from from working groups. Um, so I, what I think we'll do is we'll hold that till three thirty. Uh, and and uh, and then we've got a good good block of time there. Yep. We can dive deep into yep. it. And I mean, we might be able, we might catch up before then. Yep. Yep. I also want to give thanks to Ken and Cecily, my boss, who allow me to do this, be in this role and um, do this, because I do enjoy it. I really do like it. Um, I like hanging out with all you guys too, so it's pretty fun. Um, but they, I have to thank them too, because they allow me to take some of my time out of my real job to do this. Just want to say that. The predecessor always used to give us blame. Well, out of, <laughs> yeah. Do I have the budget for that, Ken? I don't know. <laughs> So that was Idaho supporting yeah. the swag. <laughs> um, are we doing very smart contingency? Yeah, um, so right. Right. Oh, quick okay. oh. report from summer meeting. IGBC asked the um, a small little working group get together to decide what we want to do on conflict, if we want to do something, what we did. So we did that. We've been, we've met a couple of times and reminder, all you guys, John and Toby and Rick and Ken, Scott, Ben and myself, we're meeting right after the meeting again for a third meeting. So we've, we've had a few discussions um, and we, you know, we came together and we said, well, there's, you know, here's a few things that we could think about doing. One is um, looking at trends and concerns of conflicts kind of tracking conflicts more consistently and across the ecosystems. We talked about um, the need to coordinate some of the stuff that we heard in the panel, the second panel, the need to coordinate not only funding, but efforts. Um, and, and how do you prioritize the geographies? You know, we've got all these conflict hotspots and how do we decide what we want to prioritize? Um, and finally, we talked about the idea of supporting a community of practice for conflict prevention. And that third one is what we decided to focus on. So at least for now. So um, we all agreed that IGBC should, should support a regular kind of a conflict summit, a similar idea to the education summit that Lori was talking about um, for practitioners. And so, you know, maybe to do a number of things, including making sure we all have an understanding of the agency roles of the regulations and sideboards that we're operating under, and then sharing information on methods, like what's working for people. Um, and you heard Amy said how to scale up conflict prevention. So it's doing that through some sort of a conflict summit. So we have a lot more discussions to have. And one of those, again, is right after the meeting, you guys. <laughs> it won't take much time, but we're going to have our third discussion. That's where the working group is right now. Do you have an idea of when you would, when the possible summit could be, or, or are you, have you guys talked about that yet, or is that right? We've talked, a, yeah, we've talked a little bit. We might be able to, I think we're going to start small. We don't want to, and maybe we can do something small this winter. Okay. Um, but. Yeah, the idea of getting a big, huge summit together this winter is probably not going to happen, but we don't want to push everything off. Yeah. So maybe we can get a small group of people to figure out, have some smaller discussions and then make it larger or, you know, over the next few years. 
one thing I forgot to mention about the summit that the IEO are doing, it's not every year. We want to do it every three to five years is kind of what we agreed on because you got to give time for the work to happen. So that's what we agreed on with our summit. We don't want to do it every year. But you're going big. I mean, you're the one you're going to kick off is going to be a yeah. The one in Missoula was about there was almost a hundred people there, I think. But so we're and just from the interest that I've heard, I mean, I think 150, potentially 200 people as well to our But there's much more. One the one thing we're sorry. But I know we're talking about it. we've had so much staff turnover, you know, amongst the bear, the field people doing the bear work, but just getting them together to learn from each other would be a big ask. And Hillary, you're talking about bringing people together from all the different areas as opposed to yeah. like start small in a geographic area. No, no, yeah. So Probably you do it somewhere talk. central in Montana, maybe where people can come. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's a focus on grizzly bears only. Yes, on black bear. Yeah, but most of you, grizzly bear specifically, but I mean, it all translates to black black bears too. Want to come then from uh, from that group? Okay, so the next thing on the agenda is a report from the bear resistant product testing program. Scott Jackson. Scott, do you want to advance your own slides then? Or that's a lot. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Oh, see that? Yeah, today. Thanks, Scott. I'm using this. Yeah. The meeting is tomorrow. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, you can just advance or hit the Thanks. All right, uh, I'm Scott Jackson, uh, Forest Service Group National Carnival Program lead as my day job, as people have been saying. But um, for this group, I'm an advisor. And um, one of the things I, uh, one of my roles in uh, as an advisor is to oversee the IGBC's uh, container testing program. It's more than containers now, so it's very specific products testing. Um, we've been doing this for a lot of years, and um, I'm just here to give an update on kind of how the 2022 testing season went, and then uh, looking forward to a uh, thing or two for the upcoming 2023 season. So. The cool certificate logo you get, which might be a very system product. So I, I, um, you know, just for, for new people, the IGBC has been involved in providing some sort of guidance or information about bear resistant products since the 80s. Uh, when um, we started saying, hey, it's a good idea to keep your attractions stored. We needed to get people a way to comply with um, food storage orders and other um, regulations around uh, attractive storage. So uh, started developing methodologies and designs for what a bear resistant container might look like. And starting with like old army cans, uh, ammo cans, and medical kits, and things like that. Um, the Forest Service, in, in my position, has been kind of more involved. Um, I think that's why the, the role came to this advisor uh, position was that the uh, Missoula Technology and Development Center, which is the Forest Service uh, program uh, based out of Missoula, that um, did a lot of the initial uh, engineering work and, and testing. Um, developing how to test them, and so it, it was a kind of a forest service function that has stayed with with our agents. And I think in this role, like I said, we've been doing this for um, um, that was from the '90s uh, or the '80s. We started getting involved uh, as an as a interagency group. We've been uh, more formally testing now for almost 20 years. Um, with uh, primarily with uh, our partners out of the Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center in West Yellowstone. Um, you know, they, they've just been a, a great partner to work with for a long time. We've tested thousands of products. Um, but it's a very visible program of the IGBC. Um, as 
David tells me that uh, you know, the, the inquiries and the looks at our website pages, um, you know, really heavy towards the, the container testing program and the people searching for uh, certified products or how to get a product certified and things of that. Um, but it's 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 applicable across all ecosystems. Uh, it's used a lot by uh, areas way outside of Grizzly Bear Range. Um, it's used in other countries. That standard for um, you know what is a bear resistant product. So it's a it's a good partnership for us with all of our agencies, the publics, um, manufacturers, and as we heard this morning, the waste haulers, communities. Um, a lot of people rely on these products to help. Um, message and implement food storage and um, city ordinances around uh, very smart communities, for instance. Um, yeah, I don't certainly do not do this alone. A um, couple of people to thank here, Patty Soka with Living with Wildlife Foundation. She's actually um, paid through uh, Wildlife Management Institute, some, some dollars from IGPC go to support that. Uh, Randy Gravatt and John Heine, the Randy does the testing. John is the director at the Prison Wolf Discovery Center. Chris Smith with Wildlife Management Institute um, has agreements, helps handle the financial end of, of these arrangements. And David's been working a lot with us um, the last year or so, um, working on uh, some website improvements and some automation um, in our process that I'll talk about in a second. 2022 results. Um, 30 products tested. Uh, you can see the breakdown of, of what they were. Um, here's an oddball year. Uh, this is um, a low, a real low number for us. And um, you can see how many of the coolers pass, which is also kind of an oddball thing. Um, I just wanted to show. What, what would be not an oddball? I mean, so out of 18 coolers, 15 pass. What I think last year it was more like a third passed. Oh. So this year it's. Two-thirds or three-fourths, okay. and um, and I just I put this slide in just to show this is an after picture of a cooler after it's been tested. It almost looks brand new. I mean, there's hardly a scratch. There's a couple of t-shirts in, but but my point is that uh, cooler manufacturers have really upped their game. They know what it takes to pass our test. They met their try lifting some of those very resistant coolers. They weigh like 50 pounds empty, and um and the, and, and the exterior is just almost bulletproof. And so um, that's great for the public. It's great for the manufacturers. Um, it's not very cool for a bear to do this because they, but they really enjoy a lot of this is enrichment for the bears to provide some, some uh, stimulation um, for them. And, you know, the bigger garbage containers, you know, they can get some flex in there and push on them. That's interesting to them. Um, some products that crack or they can get a, a tooth mark into it. They can start working on that weak spot. Um, that's what they like to test. They'll give a, they'll really uh, get into giving that um, that a thorough test and, and getting to our 60 minutes of, of contact time. And that is the threshold for our test. The new coolers, they can't even, they can't even scratch them hardly. So they, they try for five or 10 minutes and they, they kind of give up. And that leads to a problem to tell you that. Hey, Scott, what would be a normal year in terms of the number of products tested if this was a good question? <laughs> so this is the last 10 years of, uh, of product testing uh, numbers. You can see 2022 was the, the least number we've had in the last 10 years. I think 2012 was, was, was a low year as well. Just going back 10 years, this is the, the least we've seen. It's half of our normal average number. Um, so that's in and of itself isn't a big deal, but part of it that affects us is that we collect testing revenue and that helps fund our program. So when testing numbers are down, our um, our revenues down. And so um, speaking of that, mm -hmm. so funding in 2022, uh, we only collected 14,000 in testing fees. Uh, we also collect a uh, an administrative fee, we call it, um, that we charge manufacturers an annual fee to keep their products on our certification list, A list. Um, and then IGBC provides some funding support for the program as well and, and all its has. Um, so that 
we can tell the, those numbers don't equal the annual program cost, which is about 43K. Um, but we had some carryover because last year, in the last few years, we've had some really good years. So we had some uh, carryover um, in non federal dollars that we were able to, to make the program whole. There's a, there's a, a canister that did not pass the test. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the 2022 season here um, and why those numbers are so low. But um, but before I focus on the problem, I do want to say some cool things that are um, coming forward and we have to look forward to in 2023. Uh, working with David and, um, and Chris Smith and, and, and some web designers and um, well, so our process, um, the way it is now, we maintain an active list of certified products that the public can go to and see what products have been tested by us. We've approved them and um, certified them. It's just a PDF on the, on the website. Um, and we update it every couple of weeks during the testing season. Um, what we've been working really hard at doing is putting all of the, not just for the past, test, but the failed test as well, putting um, all of our database into an interactive format that the public can access. They can put a query in. David, you can expound on this if I'm getting something wrong, but um, you know, they can, they can search for a product type or a certain um, size or whatever they want. Um, the public can, can, can dictate what they find and they can search our database and pull up that information. Um, so that's going to be a cool thing that I think it's almost ready to go live, right? Um, no? no. <laughs> okay, maybe get ahead of it. We're in data. We're in data. Yeah, we're getting there. It's, <laughs> it's, I mean, our database is, is big and it's been. Our data is clean and ready. That was a big thing right yeah, there. That was big. Yeah, hey, that's a, a cool thing that, um, you know, we, we, that was part of our charging this administrative fee, part of our goal with that or the messaging back to charging manufacturers that fee was that, you know, we're going to try to make your products more findable, more usable, um, and be more usable, user friendly in our interface with the public. And so um, that that also goes into this this next bullet of, of um, when, when manufacturers want to submit products for our testing program, they usually just would um, fill out a submission form and, and send it in along with the check. And so we're automating all of that where it can be fillable forms that go right to the, um, you know, into our program. We can um, review them in case they're missing any information. We can get the product scheduled. Uh, we can collect their fees. All that will be automated. Also, our, um, at the Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center, when they test the product and they fill out the forms to document the testing, uh, all those will be automated forms as well. So it'll all go right into the database then, um, and we won't just be collecting things in those three ring binders. Um, also in 20, so that will be hopefully coming live in 2023 as well. And that, and that should be an efficiency for us. Uh, you know, this group this morning talked about very smart communities and, and um, you know, Rick Kevin talking about, you know, Bozeman needs 10,000 very resistant and garbage carts. Um, you know, there's we're finding out as as more communities do that and buy thousands of these at a time. Um, pointing out to some of the deficiencies some of those carts have, um, which is a problem for us because we certified them. Um, and last year or two years ago now, maybe we took the in the first time ever we, we pulled a product off of our list because of, of problems we had with it. Um, We've addressed some of those. We've worked with the manufacturer to try and up their game. It's just really difficult to get to that that lash that for those fully automated cars that nobody has to touch. They can just be emptied by a truck. Um, how to make it open for the truck, but not open for a bear is really a difficult. Turns out to be a difficult thing to, to hit 100% of the time. So we continue to work on that and to um, you know, to, to tweak our testing so that we can try and uh, Highlight or, or daylight any of those deficiencies before we start. So we'll be tweaking our protocol coming up um, in that 123 uh, also. So this last one is something I, I want to touch on a little bit more. This is our um, talking about our testing capacity. And um, 
you know, we've had, like I said, almost a 20 year history in this program, testing at Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center. They've been a great partner. Um, and, it's, and this program has really evolved, evolved a lot over the last mm -hmm. couple of decades with the, the numbers of products, the types of products, um, how to be fair and equitable to, um, and yet in, in maintain a high level of, of confidence in our program. Um, but what we've, we've got some inklings of this the last few years, a little bit, that the bears are, um, you know, they're, they're just not always interested in testing. Sometimes we thought it was the heat, you know, the heat of the summer, our testing season only runs from April to the end of September, so six months of window there, and it's over the summer, even uh, when bears are active, but in the, even in West Yellowstone, Lately, it gets hot, and um, the bears weren't always too interested. So we thought that was some of it. Um, and I know um, you saw that graph of, of numbers of products tested every year. There is variability in that, just market forces and the cost of innovation, and um, you know, it's it been up and down. It's really unpredictable and uncertain. But um, and those are a lot of those are things are beyond our control. But um, this 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 uh, topic of, of bear interest or whatever, what do we call it? Oh, testing fatigue. Yeah, is, is that a real thing? Is it, it, and it, you know, here's another one of those products that doesn't even look like it's been tested. Just, but part of it is the, 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 the strength of the products that, again, around coolers that are, that are, has, have improved it. Um, because it's, you know, this really was highlighted this year when we had this lowest uh, number of products tested. Um, but I think um, we took the unprecedented step this year of having to pull um, any product submissions. We, we put a notice on our website. I think it's still up there. We didn't take that down. Um, but it said, uh, I think in June, we said. Um, Bears on strike. <laughs> they, just, they, weren't, they just weren't testing. And it was people were submitting their products, but we couldn't get them tested. And so there was a big backlog. Because well, Discovery Center didn't have storage for all these products, so we just said, the time out. And um, and and it, you know, talking to the folks at GWDC, you know, what's going on? You know, it turns out, you know, there's been a few things. You know, the number of bears they have is down. The uh, the ages of the bears they have are getting older. Um, personalities of the bears, that is, you know, whether you can put multiple bears out at one time and let them get along or not. Um, so there's been some of that change. Um, have a new policy there where they used to try to keep them a little bit hungry before <laughs> testing to, to motivate them to want to get into the bait that's inside of them. Uh, they don't do that anymore. They want to control the aggression amongst the, the bears that are out there. So um, that's part of it. Um, you know, but I do think that the, 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 the strength of the cooler now, which is the majority of the products we test are coolers, and they, um, it's just not interesting why they don't, they don't engage. So we saw that uh, not only is it a decrease in revenue for us, but it just, it kind of business are we that we, we have to tell people, you know, don't send us your stuff. We don't, we're a testing program, but we can't test your products. So um, that was, um, not good business. And so uh, we did kind of get back on track towards the end of the season, but there were quite a, there were a number of, of manufacturers that did not submit products in 23 and, or in 22, and that was not the way to continue. So we started thinking about what, what we can do about this. Um, this is what more of the coolers used to look like when we were testing. Um, so we propose increasing our capacity for next year um, and but in a, in a start small kind of approach. We would maintain testing at Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center, um, but then try to find an additional Grizzly Bear facility that we could partner with. And we've had, uh, when we went through a formal process 10 or 15 years ago of, of um, more formalizing our relationship with Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center, you know, we had some criteria for or um, that they met that that we felt were important that they have a conservation mission. You know, they're not a 
roadside menagerie type of thing. You know, they're accredited, they're a, they're a not-for-profit organization. Um, and so we we did a little um, thinking about this, and I, I think we have, um, we've had uh, a, a facility that has, we contacted them, they said, yeah, you know, I think we're interested in that. And um, and we've been continuing to have some conversations. Uh, it's not finalized, I've been put, but it is, it's uh, um, the Bear Center at Washington State University in Tolton. Um, they do a lot of really cool, great grizzly bear research, um, great reputation, great people. And um, so we are in the ongoing discussions with them. We hope to um, get that up and running by uh, by April of 23, and we can start sending my 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 plan. The way I envision this is we would start sending them some of the coolers, since that's kind of our backlog. Um, with some new bears, um, they're easy to ship and easy for them to handle since they're new at this too. Um, so hey, that's that's what I'm hoping for as a as a solution to this issue of of um, or this concern around our bears at Prison Discovery Center. Uh, Going on straight. So money wise though, how how would that would you, would we have an increase in cost or would you shift money from the other from our current place? It would be it would spread the money out a little bit. I think IGBC would wouldn't see that much difference or, or our program wouldn't see that much difference, but uh Brisbane World Discovery Center would see less revenue because they we split the fees between the testing facility and um IGBC. And um, so it would be less revenue coming into the Grizzly Discovery Center. They are fine with that. Um, we, we talked about that right up front because they didn't want to create any, any friction there. Um, they're like they're totally fine with somebody else having some of this fun. Um, <laughs> that's the fun question. Yeah. I don't know how many people know this, but a long time ago, before I was around, IGBC asked Fish and Wildlife Service to take some of our contribution, some of the money we give to IGBC and give it to WSU Bearside. So we've been giving, we have a cooperative agreement with them. I think it's maybe $10,000. We give them annually. So, you know, we could even write this into our cooperative agreement because it was IGBC wanted us to do that. And they've been super useful on, on other things. We do a um, trainings there sometimes, like this year we brought brand new bear people to the bear center where they can actually immobilize bears right there hands on in a controlled environment. Um, so yeah, it's it's cool that we're going to be. Do they have black bears there too? No, no, it's just because it's okay. That's yeah. It. yeah, it seems like a really good fit and and they, yeah, we've had several conversations. They're working on some behind the scenes stuff. We would have some new agreements and stuff to put in place, so we've been exploring that, and um, we'll see. I, I just don't want to oversell it because it's not confirmed just yet, but it looks open. Um, I think that is all I had, just as a preview of what's coming up, kind of where where we've been this last year and what we what we tackled. I think um, we've been making continued improvements to the program. Dealing with issues as they came up, like the, the, the fully automated cards, we'll continue to look at that. This, this testing limitation piece is kind of new, but I think the writing's been on the wall. It's never good to have all your eggs in one basket, so I think having a, a second facility will, will be a good show. Any questions? A couple questions, Scott. That's really interesting. It's all new for me, so I appreciate it. Um, so you said something. I guess my assumption going into this is that a, um, a cooler or whatever piece of equipment that a grizzly bear can't get into, a black bear couldn't get into either. But, and I know that the reverse conversation is going on. Something's bear certified for black bears. Does that mean it would work for grizzly bears? And that's not that's not the question here, Bill. When you said that some of the uh, canisters now are actually failing, um, you mean and, garbage carts? Yeah, 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 garbage carts. Uh, is that because black bears are getting into them? And is it is is my assumption wrong that like with their paws being differently structured and it is so a couple of really good interesting points there, Jim. The, the, the anatomical difference is, is a really interesting question. We don't really have any good empirical apples to apples comparisons of 
putting products in with both blackberries and grizzlyberries, see which ones, you know, if there's a difference of which one they can exit. Um, the issue with the, the garbage carts, again, getting back to the, the ring doorbell cameras and you could see now what's going on. I mean, so when somebody has their their garbage cart, they go out in the curb and mm -hmm. garbage is all over in the morning. You know what happened? Um, you know, well, turn. You know, sometimes it is human error. You know, that wasn't closed, or it was overfilled, filled, or it had just been damaged, been hit by a car or something. Um, and so it wasn't operating. I mean, those are failures, but they're not a design issue. It's not a manufacturer's mm -hmm. issue. Um, with the um, with more with these fully automated carts that are designed to nobody has to touch them before they're emptied. You put it out in the curb and the truck comes by, picks it up and dumps it, you know, and sets it back then. Um, they're designed with a with a latch that that stays shut except when it's tipped. Um, and so it doesn't matter whether it's a black bear or a grizzly bear. We've had um video of, of bears and, and knocking them over or knocking them over in a certain way that must mimic the dumping action and not that they open up. That's something our previous testing didn't. If, if the bears don't do that in the testing, if they're just bouncing on them or chewing on them, it might not mimic that. So to address that specific question, last year we brought to this group, the addition to our testing protocol where for the fully automated garbage carts now, instead of just the live bear test, we still do a live bear test to make sure a bear can't open it up. But we also take it to a garbage hauler and ask them to dump it and make sure it opens for them. Sometimes those latches, what we were speculating is happening is they would tighten the latch, so to speak, for our testing, for the live bear testing, so nobody can, but then it, They'd sell them like that, and people would complain that it doesn't open. Um, so then they adjust the latch tension, so to speak, down. It opens really easy for the, the truck, but it doesn't. It also opens up mm -hmm. really easy. So mm -hmm. it's a tricky finding that sweet spot. It's really difficult, and the latch question seems to be the biggest. So we have some other tweaks we're contemplating for the 2023 season to adjust adjust that too. It's not a species question as much as it is just yeah. any bear could do this. That's what yeah. it is. Um, so for one point on the finance question that came up. Um, so yeah, again, we, you collect fees and those fees get divided um, amongst the testing facilities. And you mentioned carryover. Um, and so we are in, in, in fine shape. Um, and part of the reason for that is that we've uh, admit we've uh, instituted an administrative fee. So for a product that is currently in um, production, um, it, it's on the, our you know, product A list, um, and that means that they have every year are paying a, you know, the small administrative fee to keep that that listing. Um, and, and if they don't, then that, that means sort of tells us that they're not uh, in production and it's uh, not as easy to find. You, it might be still be out there um, even in a used form. It's not available for purchase. Yeah, we don't want to take them off the list just because they're not paying the fee because they did pass the test and they are still considered a bear resistant products and if somebody bought one five years ago we could still should still be in compliance with what the regulation they're trying to but but having manufacturers submit in the electronic format collecting payments in electronic format um well it's going to help us keep track of mm -hmm. the status of this going forward and it's i think i think we're going to see i'm mean, hopeful that we're going to see some improvement in relationships with the, the manufacturers and they'll see that the value for the, to keep their products you know, current, um, so and we're just keeping we'll keep an eye here on the on the volume uh, with with the finance question, um, and then on your question about the multiple species, you know, this program has always been a grizzly bear program. Right. Right. Um, for for much of its history, it's been the only program, <laughs> um, and that's why in some other places they might refer to our our list. Um, but I guess recently, Scott, do you have any information about, I know this was the first year, 2022 was the first year of a black bear specific testing program that um, the, the CAFWA agencies um, sponsored, but I guess it's really what uh, wildlife management institute that's that's doing the testing. Yeah, that, they, they've been, uh, they were operational this year. They have, I think, uh, three or four different 
zoos primarily that they uh, they work with. Um, they're more in the east and the southeast. Um, and I think they tested a handful of products this year, just kind of getting their uh, feet under them, uh, finding out it's a bigger ask for their staff time than they were thinking. You know, it's like you only have 60 minutes of contact time. It's no big deal. Just throw the cooler in there, video it for 60 minutes, and I'm done. Yeah. And there's more to it than that. And that's that's one of the things I'm trying to make clear with WSU is that, you know, you might be in there for all day. I got student in it. I hope you yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> um, and cameras that are always watching and recording. But anyhow, they, they had some yeah, well, some concerns by the black bear testing zoo facilities that they didn't have the staff capacity. It was more than they anticipated. So, but anyhow, I, I haven't heard any uh, fallout negatively towards our program or anything, any concerns. We stay in communication um, with them as well as in the program. So, um, and I wish them the best. Yeah, and to Jim's point, our message is that we, there isn't any sort of scientific test that's been done that would tell us whether one species or another might access one product or right or, or vice versa. Oh, well, we're there will be. We'll all we can do is say, yeah, all we can do is say this is ours. We're with grizzlies. Right, right, and yeah, and I think the average public would not make the distinction, right? If they buy a bear resistant cooler, they're not thinking about it. But to my earlier point. You're also making the assumption that if it works for a grizzly bear or for a black bear. Yeah, we kind of have the assumption over time. And, yeah. and it would be nice to have data. Right. To right. Yeah. yeah. Scott, your first slide, this was the certification of logos. Made me wonder, have we trademarked that? You know, it seems like there's value to that. Great value. That. I don't even know how you do it. It's a big thing, but. Can the government? Can we? Can that, do yeah. we do that? The yeah, we can. You can. We can't. Can. Yeah. Yeah. Takes a while. Yeah. Okay. I. So who? I mean. <laughs> I know it was the. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was the Wyoming Game and Fish as graphic artist who came up with the. Sorry. Oh, you guys. But is it? Is it a? Uh, Yes, it's a, it, it would probably be one of our agencies would have to pursue that, right? As, as a as a would well, be the committee. I, but I mean, it'd be all of us would have to probably sign off on it. Yeah, it costs about five grand to get it. Okay, so I, I know what a proposal asks. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's a big opportunity. It's a You can do it by yourself, but but yeah. But that's probably why it doesn't matter. But there's nothing that I mean because it's not trademarked. There's nothing that anyone could use. As a cooler company who yeah. failed all the tests could still slap it on there. Well, that's a good point because we do get companies that say that on their websites, yeah. whether they're using the logo or not. But they say tested by you know, IGBC or and they're not. So you can do you can do both the words and the logo. You can do two separate things, and that like guarantees all of it. It's a real good idea. Probably need to check in to yes. at looking at David. Yeah. David, yeah. David. <laughs> David, could you help? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, man. We'll look there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I appreciate you talking about the potential working with the ones who bear center. It's on the off chance that doesn't pan out. Is there a, is there a plan to mm -hmm. even? You don't have to tell me. Oh, yeah, that's right. Right. We, have a backup. <laughs> we have other um, other facilities that have done ad hoc testing. You know, since they've done it on their own, and they contacted us. If, if not, those might be some of the first ones. Some of them are, you know, one thing I liked about Holman was they're in grizzly bear land in all of our four states, and so that was really handy. Um, Okay. There was another facility in BC that used to do it in the using our protocol as well. And they just they um, stopped testing last year. So, you know, that's moving in the wrong direction. So getting we'll see how it works in Pullman and, and maybe we'll reach out to one or two that I kind of glommed onto them since they, they expressed interest, but I don't have anything else that close yet. So 
Good All right. job. Thanks for your time. Oh, accessible. I just have a question um, just in terms of the logo and product. Um, if they're going to put the stamp on there, I was wondering if they should, if we should kind of insist that they have a link to the ITPC website where people find all the bear seat information. Like a QR code? Part of the logo. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Way more technologically possible with this than I have any. Absolutely. So it's okay. a good thing you don't ask. Yeah, let's see. One thing at a time. Thanks for your time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Time for a break. Yeah. Good okay so we're going to take a break now we'll return at three o'clock top of the hour and uh next up is the genetic augmentation uh, proposal um and then we we will after that um take up the spare smart um proposals to the ideas okay no yeah. Thank you.